The Vape Passion Show, episode 32. Welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. This is episode 32. I'm recording this on September 4th, Sunday. Uh, it's in the afternoon. It's not yet Labor Day here at, at the time I'm recording this, but it will be past Labor Day when you hear this. So I hope you had a good Labor Day. I've had a pretty good weekend so far. Yesterday, my brother came over and we barbecued. We had some hamburgers and hot dogs and we split a six pack of pumpkin beers. That was fun. We have several large liquor warehouses here in Colorado that uh, sell a lot of craft beers and they let you mix and match six packs so that you can uh, try a bunch of different beers at a discount. So something we like to do is we get one or two six packs of beer depending on how many people we have. Uh, yesterday it was just me and my brother so we only did one and uh, we usually give each person a small portion of each beer. So that's what we did. Uh, my brother bought all pumpkin beers which are really popular right now because you know everyone's getting ready for Halloween so we tried six different beers all of them were actually pretty good I have them here um, well this was Ichabod from New Holland Brewing and this one was okay there I didn't think there was really anything too special about it but uh, yeah it wasn't bad then there was a uh, Tommy Knocker Brewery's Small Patch Pumpkin Harvest Ale. This one has pumpkin molasses and spices. So this one was actually, I think, the worst of the bunch for me. My brother actually ended up liking it a lot. I didn't like it because I could really taste that molasses, so I didn't care for that one a whole lot. And then there was this Brickenridge Brewery's Nitro Series. It's a pumpkin coffee stout. And uh, that one was, for me, one of my favorites. I really like this one, but I really like coffee beers too. So coffee and pumpkin in this one, I thought it went to w together very well and it was good. I really liked it. And that one actually was the one that my brother disliked the most. Let's see, then we had uh, Funky Pumpkin from Boulevard Brewing Company. This is a spice sour. So if you like sour beers, I think you'd like this one. It, uh, it tastes mostly sour, like a regular sour beer, but with a little hint of pumpkin. And I actually really liked it. All right, then we have Saranax Pumpkin Ale. So this is a pumpkin and spices with natural flavors added. This was one that just, it wasn't really nothing anything special. It was a good pumpkin beer, but nothing special about it to me. And this final one is a Pumpkin Down from Ballast Point Brewing Company. And this is a Scottish ale with pumpkin. And uh, this one was pretty surprising. I wasn't expecting it to be all that good, but it was very light and had a really good flavor. I actually ended up really liking this one too. So yeah, those are the six beers that we had. If you like craft beers, pumpkin beers, uh, consider trying some of those out. I thought they were pretty good. And if you do try any of those out, let me know what you think. All right, so I finished my reviews for three of the flavors of e-juice that G-Vapor sent me, and I published them all on my website and on my YouTube channel, so you can check those out if you're interested. They are a budget brand, but they don't taste like it. I really liked all of their flavors. My favorite one of the three was Dank Sauce. That one is a marshmallow key lime pie. That one was really good, and I've almost finished vaping that already, and I don't, I don't often finish vaping hardly any of the e-juices that I buy because I I like to switch flavors so much. So that one's already almost gone. That was a good one. Then they also sent me Strawberry Banana Twist. That was also good, but the flavor was a little too light for my preferences, but it was still good. And then the, the last one was Blackberry Yogurt. And that one was also good. It was a nice bitter sour type yogurt flavor. It wasn't not in a gross way. It was pretty good. The only thing that I noticed about that one was that it had a a slightly strong throat hit and I think that's because of the blackberry flavoring uh, because some fruit flavorings just have a throat hit. What I really like about these guys, G Vapors, is that they are really good and they're really cheap because you can get a 30 ml bottle for only $7.99 so that's a really good deal I think and it's hard to find a good budget brand with a really good, with a lot of really good flavors. So um, I was happy to have reviewed those. And then I finally opened up my Sub-Zero RDA. It's a competition RDA and I've actually had it for a couple of months now and uh, I won it in a giveaway directly from sub -Ohm Innovations, the guys who created it. I finally got around to opening it because I don't open anything until I actually have time to review it. So I finally got a little bit of time to review it. Uh, not, I haven't finished the review, I just did my initial impressions. Um, so that's gonna be the first part of the vi video. Then I'm gonna use it for a couple of weeks probably and then maybe finish up the video and then uh, hopefully get that on YouTube. So far I've only been using it for a couple days so I don't have a whole lot to say about it, but um, I do like it. The flavor's really good. You get a lot of you can get a lot of vapor out of it. I mean, the airflow is wide open. It's crazy. It's it's pretty much just like breathing. So uh, a lot of airflow. You need a lot of wattage to push through that one. There's only one issue that I have with it so far, and that's that e-juice leaks from the bottom of the barrel 
where the atomizer connects to the mod. And there's an O-ring here above the airflow holes, and I think that the O-ring just isn't thick enough. So it allows e-juice to seep down to the bottom of the barrel and then it ends up sitting on the bottom of your mod, or on the top of your mod. I've seen other people saying the same things, having the same issue with theirs, and they say that you can switch out the O-ring with the, with the extra that comes in the kit. For some people that has worked, for some people it had, it had the same problem. And they had to get a different O-ring, which then did eventually work. So we'll see, might have to get another O-ring for it. But other than that, it's a pretty good atomizer. It's expensive though. I looked up the pricing and this one is $75. I think their lower priced model is 55, so that's a little bit more reasonable. But yeah, it, it's not bad. So anyway, with all these Labor Day sales happening, I've been really having a hard time keeping my credit card in my wallet. I've done a pretty good job so far, but Labor Day weekend isn't over yet, uh, not at the time of this recording, so I don't know what I might end up with. I've, I've been kind of thinking about buying like a Heracles tank, because I've seen that for $10, a TFV8 for $20, or maybe the TFV8 Baby Beast, I think it is. Um, I've seen that for 10. What else is there? The the Goblin Mini I think I saw. I don't know, all of these things were really cheap and I'm having a really hard time not buying them. Really the only thing that's holding me back is those shipping and handling costs. The only thing that I have purchased so far is some stainless steel wire from Lightning Vapes. That's it, it was $10 worth of wire, so not a big deal. But yeah, it's that time of year when everyone starts having holiday sales. So uh, my favorite time of year for vape stuff. All right, so let's talk about some new products. This first one I wanna talk about is the Wismic Silen. And the reason I wanna talk about this isn't because it's something that I want, it's because I've been seeing a lot of really bad reviews for it. I've also been seeing a lot of people putting it on up for sale for uh, like half off. And I think it might be because of these bad reviews. It's kind of a, a heads up if you're if you, it's been something you've been looking at. The review that kind of prompted me to add this to the, to the show this week is a review from spinfuel.com. They did a review of the Silen and uh, they pretty much hated everything about it. The final grade that they gave it was an F and uh, some of the things they mention here are like there are just too many pieces, something like nine pieces, so cleaning it is a hassle, taking it apart is a hassle. There's something like 11 O-rings. The airflow control is a little finicky, so you have to wick it just perfect. If you if you put too much cotton, then you're gonna get dry hits. If you put too little cotton, the e-juice is just gonna pour out of your tank through the airflow holes. So uh, that sounds like a, a, an issue. The tank is really hard to take apart. The person in the spin fill review, they actually had to use pliers and uh, they were worried that they were gonna put too much, so much pressure on it that the glass tank was gonna break. So it was that hard to get off. Another issue that they found with it was that the 510 pin is made of Delrin, or the, it's, it's lined with Delrin, and it protrudes far out of the bottom which makes it so that it doesn't fit on all devices with shallow 510 connections. So that's a pretty big deal. If you have a device that has a shallow 510, the tank might not even work on your device. So that sucks. And then they say that the flavor was below average. So is it really worth all that hassle to go through for below average flavor? I don't know. I also watched Rip Tripper's review and a couple of other reviews for it. And they, other people have said that it's actually not that bad. And I watched, when I watched Rip Tri Tripper's review, it didn't really look all that bad to me either. It's probably more for an advanced vapor. And even then, if you don't like spending a lot of time fiddling with your tank, you might not like it. And Rip Tripper's actually mentioned that in his review, that it's a tank designed more for people who like to fiddle with their devices. I'm not much for fiddling with stuff, personally, so uh, after reading Spin Fuel's review, I have no plans on buying that tank. All right, and the next product I wanna talk about is the iJoy Combo RDTA. So this is a really interesting tank. It's uh, similar to the other Limitless tanks that iJoy has created in cooperation with Limitless Mod Company. So it's a Genesis style atomizer, so the, the deck sits above the e-juice chamber and if you don't want it to be a tank you can remove that tank piece and it becomes a dripping atomizer an RDA so you can use it as either as either a tank or an RDA and that's really cool this has something like seven interchangeable decks so you can really customize this to whatever preference you want I, I think that's really cool now these seven optional decks they don't come with a device you do have to buy them separately it does come with two of them, I believe. So if you do want all of those decks, you do have to buy them. This one has a single coil plug, so you can change it to single coil. And this one now has a 510 adapter, so you can use your own 510 drip tips now, which I believe the previous models didn't have that feature. So uh, that's pretty good. It looks really nice. I watched iJoy's uh, demonstration video of this, the preview video, 
and it looks like really nice atomizer. There's no reviews for it yet because it's not out, and you can get it for $45.99 when it does launch, uh, probably cheaper from other uh, vendors when it does come out. Now that we're on this topic of iJoy and Limitless, there's some drama going on between them now. So Limitless, or iJoy actually, they posted a picture on Instagram, and Limitless Mod Company left a comment on that picture. Uh, they said, iJoy stole our ideas and has refused to ship us products and is now stealing customs. Do not purchase from iJoy, they are crooks. Any products with Limitless logos on them are clones. iJoy also posted on Facebook, and Limitless Mod Company also responded there, and they said, we shared all of our ideas with them, and now they are stealing them and making them as their own, and stealing our customers. We were robbed by them. So yeah, a lot of drama going on. Uh, Limitless actually posted a, a blog post on the parent company's website, Vaporhub, and then uh, removed it. So I haven't seen it. I, I don't know, I have no idea what it said, but I'm assuming it prob probably says a lot of the same thing. And iJoy responded to this with their own blog post. They did it in a much more professional way. So they started out the post saying that the attack from Limitless their behavior is inexcusable. And then they walk through a timeline of their history with Vaporhub, uh, the, the parent company. Their relationship started in 2015 with the Asolo box mod, which Vaporhub started selling. After two deals, Vaporhub required terms to continue selling iJoy's products, and iJoy declined those terms. Then iJoy designed the Limitless RDTA, and Vaporhub saw potential in it and offered to co-design the device with iJoy. So basically, Vaporhub wanted their label on it in return for marketing it in the United States, although Vaporhub really had nothing to do with the design process. Eventually, Vapor Vaporhub did design their own atomizer, the Limitless RDA24, and iJoy manufactured the atomizer for Limitless but had no say in the design process. Uh, that's the only Limitless atomizer that Vaporhub Limitless designed. All other Limitless atomizers were designed and created by iJoy, according to iJoy, and they also attached some design files to their blog post to prove this. Um, I, I wouldn't say that that necessarily proves anything, but they did provide those. And then they went on to talk about their disagreement with Vaporhub about the prices of the products that they were creating for them. So the Limitless Lux, for example, was originally supposed to be sold for $60, but Vaporhub required the price to be $150. And also the Lux was originally named the iJoy XO, but Vaporhub didn't want anyone to, to know that it was being created by iJoy, so they changed the name. Okay, so that covers Limitless Mod Company's claims about, about iJoy stealing their ideas and that all products with Limitless logos are clones. It sounds like both of those claims are false. Now, as for Limitless Mod Company's claims about refusing to ship products and stealing customs, iJoy also talked about this. So they actually said that they are willing to ship products to Vaporhub on the grounds that Vaporhub pay for the products up front, which they haven't been doing. What they were doing originally was requiring iJoy to send the products and then they would pay for it. That's a a strange way of doing business because uh, no one usually has terms like that. So I think it makes sense that iJoy would want payment up front first. All right, so now with all of that being said, if you look at the new iJoy combo RDTA and the Limitless RDA24, which is the original, supposedly, and the atomizer that Vaporhub designed themselves, they do look very similar. All of the products that came out after the original are very similar and obviously designed based on the original. But then again, iJoy claims that they created the original Limitless. And uh, so I don't know which one is the original here. I don't know if it's the Limitless or the Limitless RDA24. It's uh, kind of confusing to follow here. Either way, let's say that uh, uh, Limitless Mod Company did create the original. If they did, and now iJoy is creating products based off of it without giving I, uh, Limitless any credit, is that unethical? Uh, I think that's kind of in the eye of the beholder because this has been happening since the beginning of vaping uh, and this happens in any industry really and uh, we wouldn't have the products that we have today if people weren't doing this and it reminds me of this quote from Steve Jobs one of his most famous quotes where he stated that Picasso had a saying good artists copy great artists steal and we have always been shameless about stealing great ideas what he meant by that was that they steal some they don't steal something exactly as it is but they take an existing idea and repurpose it and redesign it and make it better. And I think that's what people do in this industry, in vaping industry. I do understand that Limitless Mod Company might be upset about them doing that, but I don't think you can really expect to come out with a device and not have someone use that as a base for their own ideas and to improve upon. So one example would be that the Orkish RDTA, which came out before the Limitless RDTA, uh, that one pretty much looks exactly like the Limitless RDTA, and uh, people do believe that Limitless Mod Company actually copied that model. So uh, does that make Limitless Mod Company thieves themselves? Maybe. Anyway, going back to how this whole discussion started, 
I think the combo looks pretty sweet, and I want one. All right, now let's move into some health and research stuff. So I came across this article from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and this one was titled, Is it too late to quit smoking if I have been diagnosed with cancer? And the reason I wanted to bring this one up is because I've seen this question on a lot of forums before. I've even heard people from my life mention this. Uh, my friend's father actually died of cancer, and he wouldn't quit smoking because he felt like, what's the point? This question was covered by tobacco cessation expert Jamie Ostroff, who works for that cancer center. She says the answer is a strong yes because continuing to smoke after a cancer diagnosis can adversely affect the outcome of your cancer treatment. By continuing to smoke during and after treatment, that increases your risk of treatment complications and makes it more likely that the original cancer will return and that a new cancer or other tobacco-related health condition will develop. She also points out here in a recent study that showed patients with early-stage lung cancer can double their chance of survival over five years if they stop smoking, compared with patients who keep smoking. I just think that's a, a good thing to keep in mind um, if you know anyone who is a smoker and who has developed cancer and they don't want to quit smoking because they feel like you know what's the point now direct them to vaping and show them that they really can increase their their probability of recovering from cancer and treating their cancer by quitting smoking all right the next one i want to talk about here uh, this one was published on pubmed.gov and it's titled electronic cigarette use in the eu analysis of a representative sample of 27,460 europeans from 28 countries so they started this study with the goal of finding out how common electronic cigarette use is in the U european union and they also wanted to find changes in smoking status due to e-cigarette use and how that correlates so the participants included a total of 27,400 European Union citizens aged 15 years and older. And what they found was that anyone who has ever used an e-cigarette once or twice or more, that was 31.1% of current smokers, 10.8% of former smokers, and 2.3% of never smokers. So extrapolating that data to the whole population, they approximate about 48.5 million European Union citizens were ever e-cigarette users with 76.8% of them using nicotine-containing e-cigarettes. They estimate that 6.1 million of their citizens had quit using e-cigarettes, and 9.2 million people had reduced smoking with the help of e-cigarettes. And only 1.3% of never smokers used nicotine-containing e-cigarettes. So those claims that you hear about teens using e-cigarettes and using nicotine, potentially getting an addiction, uh, is, is pretty much unfounded. There's uh, there's no basis for that claim. Another great conclusion out of the study was just that you can see how many people really had quit smoking with the use of electronic cigarettes or even reduced the amount of smoking, which is also a lot better for their health. So there's some very positive results from that study. All right, this next one I want to talk about here was a, a forum post on ecigaretteforum.com. So this guy, Louis325, he made a post previously about having uh, extreme anxiety and depression, and he thought that it might be caused by vaping. Well, he, it turns out that he does believe that that turned out to be the case. So he's not saying that vaping is bad because he believes that it has been a lifesaver for a lot of people. But in his case, he does believe that the nicotine was causing severe anxiety. So after doing a lot of testing, uh, changing tanks, PG, VG, uh, different flavors, things like that, he has come to the conclusion that it's really about how much nicotine he's using. So what he started doing was just taking one large pull and uh, that seems to satisfy his cravings for nicotine and but doesn't give him any kind of anxiety or dizziness or panic attacks. So I actually wanted to bring this up because I used to have severe anxiety when I was a smoker and I know it was because of smoking because it would only happen after I smoked. It wouldn't happen every time I smoked but only when I smoked. So. I was well aware of the cause at that time. I mean, I, I knew that I, there was a chance for me to have bad anxiety after smoking, but I was addicted. So I had no choice but to suffer through it a lot of times. And for me, it would get so bad that I couldn't even leave the house. I mean, I would just have to stay home and uh, wait it out, which could take, you know, four hours, six hours. So uh, it could be pretty miserable for me. And then when I f quit smoking, my anxiety pretty much disappeared completely. Uh, it was one of the first benefits that I noticed after quitting and I still remember making that post on Facebook telling people like I quit smoking and my anxiety has totally disappeared like I was I was just so happy about it. It's actually pretty well known within the medical community that nicotine can cause anxiety or it can make it worse for people who suffer from bad anxiety. Since I've been vaping I actually have had two or three occasions where I've I've gotten a little bit of social anxiety after uh, like chain vaping or using a high milligram nicotine. So now I keep my nic levels pretty low 
uh, and uh, it, that works for me. I don't have any issues with vaping low levels of nicotine, and uh, and I actually prefer the way low nicotine makes me feel anyway. But yeah, I thought that was uh, an interesting topic. All right, this next talk topic I want to talk about is uh, some tips from Grim Green. He started a new vlog. He publishes these on Tuesdays. They're called Tuesday Bro Tuesday. So his first episode for that vlog just came out, and he answers viewer mail in these episodes now. And uh, one of the questions he got was about how to travel with vape stuff. So who better to ask than Nick a question like this? Because he travels a lot and he vapes a lot, so obviously he would know. And uh, basically he says it's really easy. So all you need is a one quart size Ziploc bag, and that's where you put all of your liquids. So you put all your e-juice bottles in there, and when you go through security, you take that bag out and put it on, in the tray on the, that goes through the conveyor belt. So that's all you need to do for e-juice. Um, for your mods, any loose batteries, they do need to be in some sort of case, and then you just put them in your carry-on, and that's it. If you have a mod that has any lipo packs inside of them, you need to five-click it off, make sure it's off, and then put it in your bag. For any of your other mods, uh, same thing. Uh, take the batteries out and put them in your carry-on, and you're good to go. So really, that's it. That's all you need to know about that. And now with the holidays coming up and a lot of people traveling to visit their families, uh, I think that's probably some good stuff to know. Okay, the next one is, uh, this This topic was from Mooch, Battery Mooch, and uh, he's he tested the Samsung ICR 18650-26F batteries. I guess they're being sold with some high, po high power mods, uh, like the Smoke H Priv 220 watt. And he says this is very dangerous. Uh, based on his test, this is a 5.2 amp rated battery and will perform badly above 5 amps or 20 watts. He says if they're used in a high power device, it could heat the batteries up enough to damage them or even cause them to vent. He recommends not using them above 5 amps or 20 watts per battery and uh, really he recommends not using them at all. There's so many really good batteries on the market right now that there's really no reason to use these batteries. Don't buy them, and if they come with one of your devices, don't use them. You can get good batteries for pretty cheap. I see deals all the time for uh, high quality batteries on Mooch's list for a pair for like 10 bucks. So it's really not worth taking that risk. All right, this next one I wanna talk about is a post that I came across on vapingunderground.com. So this guy, he has a noisy cricket mod he's been using for over five months now, and he uses it daily. And uh, he's got two sets of married MXJOs, and he runs it at 0.46 ohms, definitely not running it too low for a series mod. He took the switch apart to clean it, and he noticed what appears to be burn marks on the switch button. He also noticed on the bottom of the battery that there are some black marks, like, like it's been arcing. So he checked the inside of the mod for foreign materials, and it's perfectly clean. Uh, it, the mod has never gotten overly hot. He's never had any venting issues, and the batteries are only three months old, and there's no issues with wraps or anything. So he's asking, what could the problem be? Is it really arcing? And he re received a really good comment here from someone saying that when you, you're you using a substantial amount of power in a mechanical mod, it's inevitable to get arc marks. It just happens. Um, whenever you remove the batteries to charge them, get a number two eraser to both the fire pin and the negative end of the cell, uh, and that should clean those arc marks right off. After a while though, when the batteries get enough of those marks that they don't come off, you just want to replace the battery. He says there are a bunch of reasons why this arcing happens, but a good way to avoid it is just to build higher and keep the fire pin and threads clean at all times. If you like to build low, then just expect to replace those batteries every few months. There was another comment here from someone saying to try adding a small amount of deoxid gold. You want to make sure the contacts are very clean first, and that will eliminate most arcing. So yeah, that's something I, I didn't know. Uh, I've used mech mods, I have a few of them. I've never noticed any kind of arcing marks on any of, on the firing pin or on the uh, on the switch or the batteries. So uh, yeah, I didn't know that, but it is good to know. And uh, it's, it's nice to know that you can clean that up with a number two eraser. All right, now I wanna provide an update to something I talked about a few months ago, a couple of months ago. It was titled, uh, it was a, a post on vapingunderground.com and this guy, he created a post asking people to recommend flavors. He was gonna create pretty much like a Frankenstein e-juice. He was just gonna take all of these ingredients that people suggested in the thread and put them all together into, into one e-juice and see what it came out like. So he finally did that and he provided an update to it. He says that he did make a video of him vaping it, but he decided not to publish it because it actually turned out to be pretty good. So there's really no reason to publish the video. He says that it, it does smell pretty bad. It smells like someone mixed a whiskey and milk, then used the drink as an ashtray. But the flavor overall is pretty good. He says that out of all of those flavors, the black licorice is the most prominent, but it's still pretty faint. So it's pretty interesting that it came out that way, 
because this e-juice had some weird flavors. It has like uh, cheesecake, butter, uh, tobacco flavors, whiskey, vanilla, lang lang, which is like a flower, and black licorice and malted milk. So uh, my original prediction was that the e-juice was going to taste very floral because of that lang lang, but it turns out that it was the black licorice. I kind of get the feeling that there were just so many flavors used here that they all kind of muted each other out. But I think if there's any lesson to be learned from this is that it's really easy to make e-juice. You could just combine so many flavors and come up with something that turns out to be pretty good. And I know, I see posts all the time from people talking about how afraid they are to get into DIY e-juice. And uh, I think that uh, this is just proof that you don't need to be afraid of doing it. It's just pick up some flavors, uh, throw them together, and you probably have a, a pretty vapable e-juice. Is it wrong of me to have hoped that this e-juice would have been really terrible? Because I did. I, I really wanted to see this come out really nasty, and I wanted to see a video of this guy vaping it. All right, and then the last topic I want to talk about here is a, a, a neat website I came across. It's called the Crazy DIY e-liquid machine. So you can just go to this website, and they generate randomly e-juice recipes. They say that each re recipe will be unique and they just randomly create titles for them. So let's see, I'm gonna actually do this while I'm recording, push the button to make a, a random e-juice. I come up with Corneferos Raspberry Guano. So this recipe has dragon fruit, vanilla cupcake V2, green apple, and raspberry. So uh, that sounds pretty good actually. Uh, I can see all of those flavors going together well. I have seen some pretty disgusting recipes on other forums talking about this website. So. Uh, probably playing around with it. You, you might not get always a good recipe. If you go to the settings, you can actually change what kind of ingredients you want to use, and that's probably what other people have done. They have like uh, settings for dessert, bakery, fruits, candies, drinks, mint, tobaccos, and savory flavors. So you can do some of those or all of those, whatever you want to do. And, and I could imagine that if you start adding like savory flavors to fruit flavors, you probably get something that wouldn't be so good. But uh, you can also check boxes for whatever brands you prefer, like Capella's, Flavor Art, Flavora. Uh, there are a few other ones here. Uh, I think it's a really cool idea. If you like to DIY and you're just looking for a new idea, maybe you haven't seen any good recipes lately and you just need some inspiration, check out this website. Do a, a random recipe and see what it comes out like. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for episode 32 on vapepassion.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at vapepassion. I'm also on Facebook and all the other social networks. Uh, if you listen to this on the podcast and you'd like to get a video version of this show, just check it out on YouTube. And if you listen on YouTube and you don't have time to watch the video and you listen to podcasts regularly, uh, check me out on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you'd like to get updates of when these new episodes go up or of any reviews I'm doing, you can subscribe to my newsletter. You'll find that on my website at vapepassion.com. Passion.com. And like always, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to email me anytime, alex at vapepassion.com, or just go to my website and use the contact form you find there. Okay, I'll see you next week.